preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening. My name is David Spector. I'm an architect and a long-term member of the board of the 92nd Street Y. Before introducing tonight's program, let me tell you about some upcoming evenings which we would not want you to miss. Our lecture series, Issues in Foreign Policy, kicks off on February 5th with Vladimir Posner and Hedrick Smith, and continues with Abba Eban, Lester Thuro, and Alexander Haig, Jr. UPI White House Bureau Chief Helen Thomas will deliver the annual Goldberg Lecture on Thursday, February 20th. And our Artists' Visions series continues on Tuesday, February 4th with Dorothea Rockburn. By the way, next Thursday in this series, uh, Robert A.M. Stern will be the speaker. Tickets for these and all of our spring lectures are selling quickly, so we encourage you to purchase tickets in advance. Finally, if you've not received your whole Y spring catalog in the mail, please pick one up this evening in the lobby. It is an honor and a pleasure for me to introduce this evening two men whose contributions to the built environment I greatly admire. Paul Goldberger will introduce Antoine Predock, whose work to me has the stuff of myth and poetry, buildings that somehow link earth and sky. It falls to me to introduce a man who really, really needs no introduction. Unless you've been out of normal media range, say the moons of Jupiter, you'd certainly know that Paul Goldberger has been the architectural critic of the New York Times since 1973 winning a Pulitzer Prize in 1984. You'd probably know that he's hosted this series, The Shape of the City, at the Y since 1983. You'd be forgiven if you'd missed knowing that he's received the Medal of the American Institute of Architects for his architectural criticism and the President's Medal of the Municipal Arts Society. And we wouldn't necessarily expect you to know that Paul is married to an attorney and is the father of three sons. You may have wondered why Paul's byline hasn't been appearing with its usual regularity in the Times. In mid-1990, Paul was elevated to the post of cultural guru of the New York Times, overseeing the aesthetically significant labors of more than 50 critics, editors, and reporters. Speaking for myself and for many architects, I'm very grateful to Paul for keeping architecture right in the public eye and mind in fact, for educating our clients. Paul Goldberger. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you very much, David. It's a pleasure to be back at the old stand again. Um, this series has become, I'm not sure how much of an institution it's become in the cultural life of the city, but it's certainly become an institution for me and something I really look forward to and am especially happy to be beginning a new season of. Um, as David Spector said rather quickly, let me uh, say it in slightly more detail, uh, we do have a program change this year. Uh, unfortunately, Maya Lin has been called out of the country. Uh, on February 6th and is unable to be with us. Uh, she was eager to come on one of the other dates. Uh, neither of the other two architects wish to yield their hard-fought schedules to her. Uh, and this hall, happily for the Y, is so fully booked this season that we could not add another evening for her. As a result, uh, she'll join us, we hope, next year and Robert A.M. Stern, who appeared some years ago in this series, is going to come back for a return engagement uh, one week from tonight. Uh, he is one of the most articulate and energetic architects on the scene. Uh, among all people practicing in architecture, among the very finest talkers, so I know it will be a good evening. Uh, now it's a great pleasure to introduce to you Antoine Predock, whose name in the last decade has really become synonymous 
with New Mexico architecture. Uh, he has lived in New Mexico for 37 years, is a graduate of the University of New Mexico, but also as a reminder of his cultural breadth and comfort with us here, also of Columbia University. Uh, he was a winner of the Rome Prize, spent a year in Rome, has taught at Harvard, UCLA, and numerous other institutions, and since 1967 has been the head of his own firm based in Albuquerque with an office now in Los Angeles as well. Uh, he will show you a range of his work to introduce the evening, and then as with our usual format, which let me remind those of you who've been here before and introduce those to whom this series is new, um, we'll begin with a short slide introduction to his work, then the lights will come back on, the great screen will disappear, and we'll sit on the stage and talk about what we've looked at and other things for a while, and then the final segment of the evening will be questions from all of you. At any point during the conversation, please feel free to jot a question onto an index card, hold it up, the ushers will be circulating, and they'll pass them up to the stage. In any case, as I said a moment ago, Antoine Predock's name has become almost synonymous with New Mexico, yet he has managed, perhaps alone among architects, to raise the idea of regionalism in the Southwest above the sentimentality of Adobe and into something profound as modern as any other architecture being produced today, and yet as much at home in its region as anything being produced today. Uh, David Spector does not present himself as a great phrase maker of architecture, but in fact, his description, the stuff of myth and poetry, is as good as any that I could offer. Please join me in welcoming Antoine Predock. I gotta remember not to lecture. Kind of breeze through these images rather quickly, but continually um, proselytize about how, to me, architecture must be imbued with content uh, long before compositional um, strategies are deployed. Um, a rooting in place, a, at this time, a projection into the third millennium at the same time. I think of a road cut um, as con a conceptual underpinning for my work, and I, I range through the road cut freely. It's easy to describe in New Mexico. When you imagine a highway road cut with Precambrian granite at the bottom, um, Pennsylvania limestone superimposed uh, upon that, and then sedimentary strata, you can sort of think of the, uh, the timeless anchor that uh, the Manhattan schist under us right now also provides. The, uh, the vagaries of um, stylistic debate and theoretical debate which is uh, uh, that copious and really Eurocentrist. I know from, from, I can say that because I went to Columbia. I fish more often in the Pacific Ocean now. I like the Pacific Ocean because the shores lap upon, the waters lap upon the shores of Mesoamerica, the uh, Indonesian archipelago, Japan. So I'm, I'm kind of uh, body Englishing myself and my crew that works on these projects more toward the, um, more toward Asia probably than I am toward French literary critics, um, although they're, they're in the picture too. I have a son who at the, at the, studying at the GSD of Harvard now who keeps me hip. He doesn't let me uh, slide too far into my, uh, as, as Peter Eisenman uh, describes me, my nature boy kind of uh, posture out in the West. Um, so the road cut, this omnipresent um, power of place, is diagrammed in slides like these. The, the um, Pedernal Mountain that so dear to George O'Keefe and so um, um, fr frequently um, described in her work is seen with sunset from Abiquiu, New Mexico and the sun dagger. I can just bring the light down. I think it's better. Uh, I don't, you'll see me later, so let, I'd rather have the uh, images really vivid. <laughs> Thank you. The sun dagger on the right at Chaco Canyon, the, uh, the slash of the uh, summer solstice, sunrise. 
marking time in, the, in, a, in a timeless land. The other aspect of the desert, and I wanted to wake everyone up right away, and, and I, I've done this after dinner, so uh, it ought to be all right. The, the, uh, the desert's really scary. It's a, it's a place, uh, a, surrealistic, a surrealistic place that has, in the road cut, after the layers of, um, of um, original primordial power, geologic underpinnings, you have cultural strata, 30, 30s hubcaps, McDonald's wrappers, and in the high deserts, the vapor of UFOs. Now, all these things, uh, <laughs> coupled with the uh, a more recent iconography, um, interests me too. I really, I really do get. Um, I'm really not really in, uh, that, that interested in, in the nostalgic adobes of Santa Fe. They're they're great and they're comfy, and I, I like to go there in the winter with the pinon smoke saturating the air and the um, the fresh snow and the Sangre de Cristos, but. The other um, layer, the top layers, the topical layers of the West, the Wild West aspects, the, the duke it out kind of strip architecture interests me a lot. And, and J.B. Jackson, the great um, American studies philosopher and scholar, is out there and inspired me and I, I think inspired people like Bob Venturi in, in terms of um, other understandings of, of, um, of the West. Wayne is an icon of the West. Ed Ruscha, in his work, uh, talks about the West in um, in fresh ways, and those um, are inspirations to me. Icons that I've contributed to the West are things like the Red Blood Bank on the left, the uh, United Blood Services building in Albuquerque. The mayor called and asked me if that was a prime coat when I finished it, and <laughs> I said, no, what you see is what you get there. Um, the, the Mad Scientist Tower of the uh, Children's Discovery Museum in Las Vegas, Nevada is a recent project. The bridge that I should say it in Spanish, it's much more um, beautiful. Este puente no va a ningún lado, pero como una pista inconclusa, transporta usted a cualquier lugar. It's a, it's a bridge that goes nowhere but can take you anywhere. It's the bridge projecting you into, into space from the uh, dining room of the Zuber House uh, in Paradise Valley, north of Phoenix. This is a walk-in kaleidoscope in a children's library, uh, part of a, an extension of a story room, puppet theater, and a phenomenological uh, deformation of views out of the building. I'm thinking more of windows as apertures all the time now. Hardly use the term window anymore. Windows are more about phenomena in the desert to me than um, simply creating um, viewports. Ship of the desert, of an information center, um, as though appearing to have landed from somewhere or have sailed across the desert floor to lodge itself in a um, dry wash. One would enter the project up the dry wash under the underbelly. You can imagine this positioned on the uh, substrate, tent-like in its imagery, ship-like, um, a lantern glowing across the, the, uh, the desert at night, um, adding another kind of light to the spectrum of Las Vegas light. My most recent house, um, the Winandi house uh, north of, of Phoenix. The, um, an ethic about uh, landscape uh, in, in terms of site planning, strategies of the materiality relating to the materiality of the buildings um, were ingrained in me very early in New Mexico, adobe architecture using sun-dried adobe bricks like this and, and mortar leading to projects like La Luz, my first um, completed work started in 67 when I got licensed. La Luz, the light, bathe in light, um, presenting a defensive posture toward the west, toward the western dust storms, the, the low sun angles, and then opening on the other side to great views of the Sandia Mountains, the great wall of um, the, the escarpment um, framing Albuquerque on the east. That was in 67, 68. These are details. I think skiing relates to architecture in terms of, of, of the body and, and the, uh, the gestural quality of making architecture. Part of this comes from studying with um, really interesting painters and teachers at University of New Mexico in the 60s. Elaine de Kooning one of, was one of them and um, students of um, Clifford Still led me to understand that my body was very involved in making marks. And to me, a ski is, is a metaphor for those kinds of uh, marks that can be translated as signature, as personal signature in drawing. 
the ski has camber, reverse camber. When it is compressed in the snow, it re the, the camber reverses and the ski carves, makes a carved line. The, uh, I call it the innocent mark. It's, it's quite a, uh, a palpable uh, connection, visceral connection to, to the snow. And when I draw, I want the, the mark to be just as um, innocent as what the ski makes. And I wanted to put my body on the line and ski one of my buildings to show you that I really mean it. I'm, I'm getting air off of a cornice on a high clear story on a, uh, a project in Tauski Valley in that shot. The extension of the innocent mark, the uh, action painting, early training, into what I do now um, ends up in pieces like this. These are collage pieces that begin to explore early strategies, conceptual strategies for projects. This is a project for a project um, in Las Vegas on the right, on, on the left, excuse me, on the right, uh, the new museum for Phoenix, which I'll show in model form in a moment. This was a, a collage piece about 20 feet wide that began to um, set a condition of, of uh, horizon and phenomenology as a, as a strategy, uh, bending light, moving light. I'm very influenced by the sculptor Constance DeYoung um, in terms of her, her use of reflection and, and her, uh, the power engendered in her pieces through um, manipulation of light. Taking that um, way point of departure from sketchbook scale done on a, a flight between Agadir, Morocco, and Rabat for a competition that I'm a finalist in against uh, Rim, Rim Koolhaas and Roland Simonet of Paris. The collage technique on the right develops ideas generated in the sketch on the, on the airplane. The idea of fronting the Atlantic, uh, plugging a gap in the dune line, re reaffirming the um, eucalyptus um, stand on, a, on an a great aquifer paralleling the sea, take letting the collage begin to diagram the project, followed through, and this keeps me hands-on, you know, with a staff of 30 or so, it's sometimes difficult. I always initiate the projects, though, in this way, um, the site on the Atlantic coast, Dagadir, the translation of those diagrams into model studies, and I work in clay, I build models like this myself. It's about eight feet wide, and I, I uh, manipulate the clay and then very uh, literally transpose those images into um, permanent models. This was sent to uh, Morocco as part of the competition, a, a, a wood version of the clay model. But every nuance of cut in the clay is, is, um, is um, cloned, actually, in the wood models. And you see a scimitar-like calligraphic um, uh, suggestive breakwater into the Atlantic against the Northwest Wave Action. Program for this is a major convention center, a Congress Hall, exhibit spaces. The kind of drawings I do are pastel and ink that um, take those model images and put them in context. The Sahara moving toward the sea, the, um, the empty space of the High Atlas and the Anti Atlas. This button here on this thing needs a little WD-40. Um, a larger model and the translation of the small model into plan. You see the breakwater here, the breakwater here, the, 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 the great gathering space, the Sahat, a titanium, titanium sundial pointer uh, arcing this way in plan at uh, summer high noon solstice. The cosmological connections to place that are so um, inescapable in that culture Understanding of the patterns of the moon. You see the sundial glinting in the sun, or the pointer, that is. Bob Becca, the, the Mecca gateway, water issuing from the Sahat above, the square above, to the east. At night, Kamar, the moon, the moon, moon tower. These kind of special effect shots, to me, are all part of architecture. They're not, the models aren't done professionally. They're done by my, me and my staff. They are study models that evolve into presentation work. The lighting and the photography, uh, in collaboration with Robert Reck, a great uh, photographer in, in Albuquerque, glistening water on the sea, the Shiroko blowing off the desert. Architecture is uh, way beyond uh, mere cerebral exercises, in, way into emotional, atmospheric content. And these, these models and images try to um, 
warp the uh, the model uh, in the model constructs toward those atmospheres. The King of Morocco is um, pondering the project and will make the final call. I want to show you Rim Koolhaas scheme and Roland Simonet's scheme in contrast to what, of course, I think is a far better piece of architecture. <laughs> um, another seaside project housed on Venice Beach in, in Los Angeles. Venice Beach is where all of the uh, skaters are and the, all of the uh, wildlife of LA end up. And I, at first I thought, gee, how obvious to do a big window to the sea. Why not do a blank concrete wall and you know, contemplate the sea on the other side of the wall? My client wouldn't let me get away with that. So the, those sketchbook studies uh, became a study of apertures. There's a runway with a divergent perspective that opens and, in fact, collapses in a mountainous sort of fashion the, the, the uh, perspective uh, from the entry point of the house. On the other end is a water-coated film of water on a black granite monolith, not unlike the one in 2001. The, the red window, the rising or setting sun, depending on the vantage point, homage to Japan. My client is a 747 pilot on the Tokyo run. It's a pivot window that weighs a ton. Um, the foreground block of granite, the, the timeless quality of concrete almost as bones set against the sea, um, the, the, the glistening runway toward the ocean and the sky sometimes melting one to the other. Another kind of aperture to the sea that I'll show in detail. Uh, an urban offering, of course, the water film is irresistible to people, dogs, bicyclists, runners. Another kind of aperture to the sea, more like my first attitude of, of uh, very carefully controlling the, view, the release of view, a, a three-quarter inch, one foot thick, uh, cast in place glass sliver. Um, the optical phenomenological Im impact is that of a laser almost when the sun plays upon it and these kinds of um, rays dance across the room coupled with the reflection off the granite in the water on the walls of the house. There, it's, it's very difficult to think of putting art pieces on these walls because the walls are, in fact, uh, alive and kinetic. I want to show you this. I was very sad to see this bearing assembly disappear into the pour of the concrete. Um, imagine trying to, we made this in Albuquerque, imagine trying to get that through uh, the airport security checkpoint. Um, on the other side, LA Narcissism uh, preserved a reflective garage door so you can primp your car as you drive in and your, <laughs> yourself at the same time. The whole upper level, upper, upper, story, upper story of the house is a um, uh, series of terraces and bleachers for basic partying. You see up here, there's a crow's nest accessible by a small ladder. Each aperture relates in different ways to the space beyond. This one to an upper level split dining level looking out over our family room level. This to the, the master bed itself, lying in the master bed, you will look right through this aperture. Um, I like the notion of uh, seizing uh, fragments of view rather than just simply opening, opening um, the building up panoramically. This project is called the Land Shark. This is the project and it bears its kin. It's a lifeguard tower for the LA beaches. Kevlar mesh, bicycle tubing, very light, ephemeral, mirage-like on the sea. The invasion of Malibu. <laughs> a project that was a very, very much a turning point project after coming back to the Amer American Academy um, out of work I, I entered my first uh, international design competition against Edward Larrabee Barnes, Arthur Erickson, and others, and won it. It was do or die, no choice but to win. The project was built, has been in operation a couple of years. Merce Cunningham opened it, um, now wants to choreograph a piece on the building, he tells me, at uh, some time. And the uh, program is museum, Fine Arts Center Museum. 500-seat playhouse, a drama, da drama dance department, uh, two towers that um, s signal gateway to the campus, pr 
providing a trust armature uh, catwalk between them for projections for hanging banners and so forth. At night, a venue both inside and out for spectacles and performances. Paul, the day you were there, it was kind of gloomy, and, and you didn't give me a very good report on the uh, entry to the museum, but I wanted to show you these sunny day shots, the descent into the nymph nymphaeum below the ground plane, this, the sparkling light coming through the, uh, the louvers, of the, the open louvers, which allow air movement up and out. This is an exterior space, a 10 degree temperature drop. The passive strategies of design that um, are so important in the desert are equally important here. Uh, they go um, unsaid in my work. I'm, I, I don't talk about them a lot. The, they're automatic. Um, making architecture is a lot, involves a lot more than that, but it's, it, it, it isn't a complete architecture unless these strategies are, are employed and perfected over time in any climate. So burrowing into the earth like a desert animal for coolness, then ascending from below up to the gallery plane. Uh, exterior uh, exoskeletal shade systems protecting from the desert sun. Dekirico like passages. I couldn't resist putting my shadow there in that one. <laughs> theater entrance and the theater house, purplish black. Stucco. I like to think of buildings as light fixtures themselves as great lanterns. I hate the idea of fixtures on poles and on bollards. Um, so I wanted the building to emanate light and not become a collection of light sources, but rather glow in an overall sense. It appears to be a desert creature with a tail, paws, inching its way toward LA. I begin a project oftentimes with a clay mo study model as the Morocco model and drawings like this. This is the archival mountain of the, Amer the American Heritage Center in Laramie, a, a Smithsonian-like collection of memorabilia coupled with an art museum, a 130,000 square foot uh, competition winning scheme against uh, Burkerts and Barnes um, on this one also. Set in the valley, um, uh, the high, I should say the high prairie around Laramie, the archival mountain um, mountain-like, literally mountain-like in its silhouette, science fiction-like in its presence, perhaps. These are topiary spruce trees uh, in juxtaposition to the asymmetrical cone. This is a building I plan on skiing also. The building points, as the shadow does in this model, toward Medicine Bow Peak to the west. John McPhee a series of articles that John McPhee uh, did for The New Yorker that became the book Rising from the Plains was a great inspiration for this project, the notion of mountains on the comeback, mountains rising rather than mountains wearing down. A new, a new mountain for Laramie. The exploded view, this is from a, an installation at John Nichols Gallery in Soho a couple of years ago. The axis toward the cone, stripping the building naked, that, taking away the epidermal layer to reveal the city within, cruised by a pterodactyl, a wrecked space station, and a mastodon. These timeless uh, evocations really interest me, and I like to, to shock my staff by going to, down to a place called War Games West and buying these little figures and sticking them all over our models. <laughs> Architecture must always um, have places for lovers, and this topiary grove uh, uh, sort of up, um, Overscaled last year at Marienbad provides that. The building in construction. You can see the, be the beginning, beginning imprint of the, uh, the arc. The substrate from below, the reliquary below, where a Spanish saddle will be positioned, coming up out of the ground into the cone above. Um, it was great to come back to New York and work on a project here, the South Transept for St. John the Divine Cathedral. Um, in an international design competition with Calatrava, Ando, uh, Holt Henshaw, Fal Jones, and other great um, competitors. I thought the, the, the least thing, interesting thing to me all, of all was to gothic, gothicize, literally, in this project. So I wanted to, to extend the, stone, the extant stone mountain, which that cathedral really is, 
I don't respect it as a Gothic building because it doesn't come from an original impulse. It comes from an eclectic Im impulse. But I respect it as a pile of stone and it has great power and, and beauty and dignity, especially moving through the interstitial realms of that building. So the interstitial realm became the essence of my ideas on this. I had just broken my right elbow rollerblading in Central Park on the way to the first meeting for this project. I could only do rather demented drawings like these <laughs> dropped by my bedside in, in the, uh, the delirium of the first couple of uh, days of, uh, of my injury. But they, they told the whole story. The idea was to grade eight blocks of stone from very heavy to very light. Part of the program was the Rene Dubose bio shelter, a, uh, a very uh, important, um, of course, an attitudinal underpinning to that congregation that, that is so uh, wonderful, the, the, uh, you know, the ecological ethic that they project. So this was to be a, become a lung for the cathedral, a, a great collector of, of sun and vegetation. So these diagrams showed dark to light. The crossing of the, theater, of the cathedral would be on this side, and then a journey through the, uh, the interstitial realms of the stone mountain, the new stone mountain. At first I began drawings like this, studying when my arm got better, studying light and the insertion of marble, thin marble slabs to make a three-dimensional uh, stained glass window. I thought the arches were just too much, though they were too literal. And so the whole thing tightened up and be needed an ordering system. So we, uh, Catherine Howe, a recent graduate from Columbia, who just joined my team and I met on that fateful day of my accident, began to study numerology as applied to this project, um, Christian numerology in particular, and the convergence with biological, num biological series, log logarithmic spirals that you see here. So that convergence was, became the um, the essential DNA of the project. And those ratios, those sacred ratios, were then projected into an assemblage of blocks, imagining this is the transept, and then exploding it. And we did that on a computer using, uh, I had choices of megatonnage on our computer software. So the, uh, I said, gee, 15 megatons looks about right. And the explosion then ventilated this stone block, this solid, uh, ostensibly stone, solid block, into a series of cavities a great spiral augers up through it, angled on the summer solstice, high noon angle. Um, it starts with Manhattan sh schist, the, um, the great bed that silvery black bedrock that thrusts up out of Central Park so powerfully. Remember that from my student days here. There's a spring below this cathedral that I suggested become the baptistry, nestling into the uh, substrate of the bedrock. From there, the limestone takes off, matching the cathedral limestone, ascending to the sky from heavy to light, with lianas and, and uh, uh, cascades of water. A ramp that circuits through the uh, interstitial realm of, of stone, climbing through chapels, chapels of herbs, chapels of glowing light for weddings. Very romantically um, organized, um, overtly romantic. A chapel of reflecting fish. I saw a great koi that long swimming around in the chapel, light high in the space, light hitting the fish, reflecting on the walls, so a, a kinetic sculpture created by those fish. I think it was a little off the wall for Philip Johnson. He was a juror. Um, the ascent through the interstitial, interstitial realm, the solemnity of this piece, the, the idea that it doesn't have a facade but rather becomes an elevation um, as an extension of an extrusion of the spaces within rather than thinking about facade composition, it simply happened as a, uh, an extension of these studies, some on computers. I saw it as a beacon for the city, a new beacon. You see the rays uh, accommodated by uh, slits in the outer skin glowing at night up there on Amsterdam Avenue, rather strangely and in a very haunted kind of way. Um, it isn't gothicizing. I, um, I didn't, I respect Santiago Calatrava very much. He's a great architect. This is his scheme. It, it, it was a, um, a, a notion of Gothic arches, uh, a tree-like metaphor. Um, I lost. I'm, I'm very bitter. <laughs> Our very, now, uh, Paul, I'm going to whip through. I, I'm taking too long, probably. Nod your head yes, if I am. Um, well, I'm about done. I'm about done. Uh, a couple uh, recent things, the, the La Jolla Playhouse, founded by Dorothy McGuire and Gregory Peck, and now uh, uh, Des Mackinoff, who brought uh, Big River, I think, to Broadway from there, um, famed uh, repertory house out west. 
I wanted to explore the threshold between reality and dream, a reflective mirrored wall, 270 feet long, just a mirror, no, not structural, not functional, only functional in a mystic sense. Um, you move through the threshold between reality and dream into a series of uh, a, a ramped uh, ascent, the threshold, and the view back to the eucalyptus grove. Moving through the eucalyptus grove, one would, would see your, uh, the audience would see their collective reflections, the silvery re reflections of the tree trunks, um, and then on up a ramp with a, a pause on a black steel cantilevered balcony coming through a mirror to view the Pacific Ocean in the distance. This is the set for Lee Blessing's Fortinbras, which it premiered there. Just opened uh, two rave reviews in time anyway, so I was very proud of that and very proud of um, Dez's production. Very current project, the um, Phoenix Science and Technology Museum, underway right now in my studio, a 120,000 square foot um, building having, housing planetarium, IMAX theater, and galleries. To conclude, I want to show Euro Disney. This is my first, uh, the, the presentation to Michael Eisner was this collage. He said, uh, can you do something Southwestern? This was in competition with Stanley Tigerman and Rim Coolhouse for this particular site. And I said, yeah, I can do something Southwestern, obviously. Um, but it won't be uh, cute Santa Fe stuff. It'll be really about the West, more like them vendors would see it, more like Paris, Texas, than, uh, than, than you know, cozy Santa Fe um, uh, evocations. So the collage uh, developed a series of trails, a trail of infinite space, a yellow line in the highway, telegraph poles perspectively arranged, a UFO at the end, John Wayne metamorphosing into Devil's Tower, um, a trail of water, a land shark, the Pacific. The West, the full-blown gamut of the West, a, a Xerox of a, an airport beaded buck, you know, belt that says Phoenix on the back, leading, winding its way through a kind of Highway 66 um, layer of um, topical uh, understanding of the West. First drawing showing a silhouette, very uh, carefully situated to block Le Bis, the north wind, the vicious north wind on that site in Marne la Vallée, open courts oriented to the south, environmentally sound planning for Paris, even though the Disney, the, of course the, my mission was to subvert the theminess of Disney. Uh, Michael Eisner is an, is an, uh, an astonishing client in his flexibility and his uh, sympathy with with these kinds of uh, distortions that Disney really hasn't been used to. They've been used to hitting you kind of between the eyes with ideas rather than um, around the edges. As it stood back in October, it'll be opening April 12th. This is the drive-in movie screen that is the focal center of the approach sequence, the one that had John Wayne on it in the other uh, model shot. It's an empty drive-in movie screen, a tabula rasa. I, I, I like the idea of it being always empty, maybe projected on occasionally the sort of haunted image, image of the drive-in movie screen in the landscape that we see in the West. The trail of water, a topiary uh, pine tree will, will crown this trail. Water will gush down this weir to a cornfield fish pond and the dance of the rain bar birds. I think our architecture is about choreography. I was married to a dancer. We used to go to rehearsals in the Met when she was in the court of ballet there. And extend, that extended into having our own company. And that choreographic impulse is always in my work, moving things, moving people in a uh, studied way. I'll conclude with these images. Um, Paul, I hope, I, have, I hope there's something left to, some time left to do some talking now. Thank you. used to be we would sort of stand around nervously watching them move all the chairs. Um, now we have high drama this year. I need um, a pair of shades. Anyway, um, that was great. It was not at all too long. Um, I don't think there's anybody else, uh, certainly nobody else who's ever been part of this series, who could begin with the three names 
J.B. Jackson, Wayne Newton, and Ed Ruscha. Um, can we talk a little bit more about the connection between those three names and what they each symbolize in their work? I mean, an artist, um, by artist I mean Wayne Newton, of course. Um, Naturally. J.B. Jackson, a scholar, and Ed Ruscha, um, a very gifted painter. Um, it's a wonderful trio because it suggests a kind of uh, eclectic impulse, if I can use a phrase that you used more disparagingly at another point in your talk. Um, what does it mean, those three names? Well, when you, uh, the, the disclaimer that I have to make um, before I even talk about that is that this is a, about performance this, uh, this evening. It's not about my work. You have to see the work. You have to go to um, ASU and see the Nelson Fine Arts Center and feel it sometime and drop me a postcard if you like it. Um, the, uh, sometimes during these kinds of uh, sure. events, I, I mean, I make it up as I go along and I, and I, I may recognize things that, that oh yeah, that, that I seem to remember that in, as an impulse right. in my work and, it, and it, it isn't prescriptive and it isn't formulaic. But the, the connection of those three, and I never have thought about the, uh, you know, any kind of um, network between them, but it's, it's pretty interesting, actually, um, has to do with um, uh, the kind of uh, later day arrivals in the West, mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. opposed to the Pedernal Mountain and right. the, or the Sun Dagger at Chaco Canyon. And I, I, I guess the point is that that interests me just as much, that, that I, I, I work my way up in, in the road cut, the conceptual road cut that I was um, picturing and and I include them and I include Ray Bradbury and places beyond too and and during the uh, heyday of um, nostalgic uh, postmodernism I I thought more about Ray Bradbury than I did Palladio in fact I I, I uh, think that imagining cyberspace imagining the third millennium is all part of the extension of my will be an extension of my thinking and getting computerized, and um, I don't see any limits. Right, right. Because you... Um, and I'm not a regionalist. Right, except you... Uh, well, you're not a regionalist in... You kept saying New Mexico, you know, New Mexico, and I don't have any work there anymore. Well, no New York... What New York architect has any work in New York? I mean, no... <laughs> um, nobody, nobody good has much work in their hometown anymore. I mean, that's... that's um, You're a regionalist if you can't get a job out of state. Right. Um, <laughs> it's one of your better lines, because I know I've heard it quoted before. That's why, um, I, that's why I said it again. It's one of and the it's best. A, it's a wonderful line, except um, you've also... I mean, I would rather think of you and your work not as representing regionalism in the kind of... Uh, ordinary and mediocre sense of being limited by a region or indeed of embracing the sort of more nostalgic and sentimental aspects, mm -hmm. but of trying to elevate a response to a particular region to a more serious architectonic level. I couldn't say any better than that. And I, in, that con, in that sense, it's, it's, a, it's a portable regionalism, and, and I, I do right. try to... Th Right, right, okay. I, I, I mean, the, 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 Arizona, the Arizona State Fine Arts Building, which is a building that, as you know, I've been to and written about, um, even though you did not think of arranging for more sun the day that I was there, um, <laughs> I liked anyway in spite of that. Uh, Thank you. And, I mean, that's a building that seems to me to be profoundly about the Southwest and certain things that, um, we believe the Southwest to be about, and yet completely free of the nostalgic, sentimental uh, Adobe version of the Southwest. I mean, this is—it's not a Ralph Lauren Southwest building. It's a, uh, a building that exists on another level. If I, I agree. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was a tough one. Good. Um, Let's, let's, let's talk for a moment a little bit more, more about that building, because it was one that I was, I was fascinated by for a number of reasons. I mean, one was what we've just been talking about. The other is just the simple, the not-so-simple programmatic dilemma of pulling together 
a tremendously complex program. It's a teaching building, mm -hmm. it's a museum, it's a playhouse, it's a sort of campus icon, it's a part of a processional movement across a campus too, and seemed to make gestures to weave itself into the context of the campus even as it also tried to stand apart as a monument. Did you, you obviously did try to grapple with all of those things. Well, there are all, all that uh, free-for-alls going on all the time, and, and the, yeah. uh, it, it extends into the morass of construction activities of, you know, real realtors and lawyers and construction managers and right. subcontractors, you know, drywall contractors and, and all that. And uh, that's a whole other uh, series of lectures, actually, a series of discussions. The thing that, um, that I, 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 I mean, I, I think it's automatic to, to deal with sun, wind, Mm -hmm. positioning a building in, in, right. a, in its location, whether it's in Manhattan or whether it's there. And it's fundamental to, to solve the program, to solve the program functionally. I couldn't have won the competition. Harry Cobb was the juror. Um, he's scary. He's really, uh, he, he doesn't fool around in terms of his critiques. I've, I've been he will juries. be here in three weeks, so we'll, or four weeks, so. Uh, he told me that the building him. needed a little editing after the competition. There was a lot going on, and I didn't, mm -hmm. I decided not to edit it. And I'd love to have him. Uh, I don't know whether Harry's seen it or not. Anyway, this. Um, so what was built is essentially the version that won the competition. Very verbatim. Verbatim. The um, the notion of program solving program solving function it goes without saying uh, that you you deal with it. But there's a naked architecture, uh, hopefully, l lurking beneath all that and any anything I I want to make that has a. Uh, that is, is obedient to some other timeless um, strata of, of um, perception and thought. And so I don't talk about a lot about program and right. you know, how it's solved and so forth. It better be. I hear about it, if, and I don't get good letters of recommendation for other projects and my you know, future clients call them, so I, I really want that to work. But the, uh, I, I see the program as cloak, clothing, um, an epidermal kind of um, overlay to uh, something that is more, much, much more powerful and timeless. In the, especially in the Southwest, you, you, um, I guess, having worked there for so long, cut my teeth there. I don't know any other way to do it. Had I been surrounded by a, uh, you know, a, a powerful, s not nostalgically stylistic, but stylistic context, a Back Bay or um, Beacon Hill, I could have been shaped another way but my roots are in place and, and the notion of composition style, thinking about it too much comes along later, comes along right, down the line right. in terms of my priorities. Well, it's interesting because I, I sense that your response to place is much more a response to the natural phenomenon of that place, the natural setting, than to the other architecture. I mean, the, the sentimental mm. adobeism that we've both been talking about is a response to is is defining place in terms of previous architecture. You seem to be going all the way back to try to define it in terms of the landscape and the natural environment that the Southwest presents. Well, um, I, I obsessively do that. I, I love Santa Fe. I don't want to, I mean, I'm really not knocking Santa Fe. I, I, I'd love to live in one of those houses. Um, you know, Mies lived in a, in a, in a Victorian apartment in, on Lakeshore Drive in not one of his buildings. I, I, I can handle it. I have a little adobe uh, outbuilding. I live in the middle of a uh, complex where my studios are, and right. I, I live there full time. Um, and I have a little adobe place. The, um, the, my search for um, you know, a different take on the place is um, it's modern architecture. I, I, the, the first project, La Luz, was a mm -hmm. you know, sun-dried adobe brick, but it was um, a modern building, you know, right. very uh, flat out. It, it, um, it had uh, fascia beams of poured in place concrete joining the older technologies. And I, I, th I, um, I think the fact that I have this predisposition uh, toward being a modern architect uh, gets me out of the, right. of the um, leaning too much on a stylistic context. It interests me a lot, though. I, mm -hmm. I, I mm -hmm. was in Rome, and I drew a lot, and I sure. studied the context there, and lived in Spain, and but I try. I don't want to do that in my work. Right, right. A lot of your work in concrete uh, makes one think a little bit of Khan, um, even though 
Khan is the last figure one would ever associate with the Southwest. Uh, is there a conscious or unconscious connection to Khan? Oh, it's in your quite work? overt. Quite I was one, he was a hero of mine along right. with Frank Lloyd Wright mm -hmm. when I was a student. Let me ask you another question that, that comes to my mind about uh, uh, the St. John Project, which uh, I had never seen in such detail as you presented it now. Uh, you, you spoke about St. John the Divine as, as coming from the eclectic impulse um, and contrasted it with the, what you called the original impulse of uh, Gothic architecture in the, in the Middle Ages. Um, yeah. and sort of rejected the aesthetic impulse in favor of the original impulse, um, yet you also acknowledge the tremendous power of St. John the Divine. My question is if the aesthetic impulse um, has such power, why then is it not so valid? If it has the power to move you to say what you did about that building, why isn't it a valid impulse? Why isn't well, I don't know whether it was the aesthetic um, impulse because I, I mean, I, I don't uh, relate to the building aesthetically. It, it, okay. I, don't, they're, they're, I don't get an aesthetic arrest there. Mm -hmm. I, um, I, because I've been to Chart right. and I fell to my knees um, without ever being um, um, a Christian and tears came to my eyes and I, it, I really I got real right. slobbery. I mean, something really... Um, Something really got me. That doesn't get me there. The presence of stone, tons of stone right. um, circulating up through the buttresses, climbing up to the um, tops of the vaults, which is a great experience if you can ever talk to anybody to take you up there. It's a it's pigeon city up there. You have to be careful. The, it looks like a great inverted ship's hull. Of course, the trusses are steel and not wood. I mean, there are a lot of giveaways. Um, but the presence of the stone, the emanation of uh, the materiality of the stone. There's a place to me where sheer materiality takes over and becomes an aesthetic impulse that overwhelms the, uh, a meager mm -hmm. uh, uh, eclectic impulse. And I'm, you know, I'm not against eclectic architecture. No, no, and I, you don't have to be I defensive mean, I, about it. And I'm not, but I just want yeah, to I, I, draw I, you I, out a little more on that. I, so. um, but I do have to separate my, my mm -hmm. take on it and, mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. you know, different packages. I, if I critique it in a, in a scholarly way, I think it's a real loser of a building, but it, uh, but it moves me. That's, that, that's what I kind of wanted to pursue. Um, uh, yes, it is a real loser of a building on certain levels, and yet it does move one. And mm -hmm. so um, there's, there's a kind of paradox to that. There's also the admixture of um, the, the attitude, the collective attitude of the, um, the uh, congregation, the, the heritage of the great biologists, Rene mm -hmm. Bose and, and others that have um, come along, the Todds, and um, to take it in, into another dimension, another exploration. And I was really inspired by that, that programmatic um, twist. Imagine it, I mean, a transept having a rainforest and a, a growing rainforest in it and having uh, systems of water, transpiration of moisture happening. I saw animals on the roof uh, living up there, chickens. And uh, I saw... Um, fish uh, uh, aquaculture and, and the husbandry of fish occurring in the chapels. I saw it as a great uh, uh, collapse of um, kind of, uh, you know, 60s touchy-feely ethics yes, with, yes. Uh, with um, the future. My spiral went toward an imagined omega point in the sky. Right. No, it's, it's, it's all true. Um, let me ask you about, a little bit more about... Uh, the La Jolla Playhouse, which is not a project I know, which was fascinating in the images you showed us. Um, can you talk a little more about that, that mirror wall, which is? Yeah, mm -hmm. the, um, the site was Eucalyptus Grove, mm -hmm. and there was the beginning of a clearing because there had been a parking lot there. And I seized upon the clearing, tried to preserve as many of the trees surrounding it as possible. Mist wafts up over the hills, uh, the cliffs of Torrey Pines. It's very near the Salk Institute, and you know it's right on the south edge of the UCSD campus. And that uh, atmospheric um, um, aura was something that got mm -hmm. me right away, and mm -hmm. I wanted to to uh, freeze it in a way to have to experientially have one dwell in that realm um, before simply walking through a door and, and entering a performance. So it was, uh, I guess, that choreographic impulse, that impulse toward procession and ceremony 
I guess I should kind of wear a priest robe because I the way I talk about all this, but the um, it it then set the stage, so to speak, for um, a crossing of that threshold, the mirror, mm -hmm. the, the ambiguous mirrored threshold, from seeing one's individual reflection, the collective reflection, the silvery tree trunks, the purplish leaves, the purplish stucco beyond. And there's an ambiguity in terms of its reflective, uh, which side reflects because the light level alters at it continually. So you move through that threshold into the uh, world of dream. You, uh, I, I thought of going to, to, uh, 40, to the 40s, to theater. I thought of going to the old Met when I was a student here with uh, Jennifer. And uh, that kind of expectation that builds when you go, the minute you walk out the door, you know, you straighten your tie when I used to wear one and you, you, uh, you know, you, you, you get in your right. car in the West, you drive somewhere. I wanted to extend that procession. Mostly, mostly what delivers at the other end of that nowadays is a six theater complex in a mall, you know, at best. And um, I like those, but um, this was a reversal of that, that kind of uh, quick hit uh, instant gratification in terms of entry and parking. And you're, you're punished a little bit. You have to walk through the mist and through a drizzle, perhaps, up a ramp, right. um, out a black steel balcony, look at the ocean in twilight, see the shimmering wall change as the sun sets, go out at intermission and discover that it's reversed and now it's reflecting toward you and not the grove in the forecourt. I, I just wanted to work with those um, um, uncertainties of that and unpredictability of atmospheres. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, does it, in effect, dematerialize the building, um, or is, do you still feel the mass of the building as well? well? You um, you see the building projecting above it as you did in the slides, but I I think the uh, the building itself is a real um, an intentional anticlimax. I right. mean, it's it's a it's a it's a shell shaped to a particular thrust stage arrangement that Des Makinoff and the La Jolla team and the uh, the, the UCSD mm -hmm. drama department liked and. Um, I mean, I like it formally, I like it sculpturally. It was worked pretty carefully, but the, the wall is the, uh, the event, right. moving through it, paralleling it on the ramp, coming back up. It's also especially nice, I would think, in, in, in an automobile culture to have a building in which there is still some ceremonial act of entry on foot. Well, you have to really uh, talk people into that. Right. And of course, there was a a lot of debate about the wall. It was, when you, when you look at budget cuts, which we had to look at on the building, you know, what's the first thing you think about? This wall is non-functional. It's not structural. It's not part of the building. It's gapped away from the building. It has only to do with magic. What's the budget for magic anymore? Um, I, I had to, uh, you know, having white hair results from a lot of, uh, a lot of hard work and, and, and uh, a lot of arm wrestling, psychological arm wrestling. And it, uh, it never ceases. And you pay a certain price, and uh, I want you all to feel really sorry for me. <laughs> While you're feeling sorry, if you can all write some questions on index cards, um, this would be a good time to remind you about that and ask the ushers if they can uh, start circulating, picking up a few, and uh, delivering them to us here. Uh, Will we ever be allowed to see the audience? Never, 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 never. They're, they've actually de dematerialized there. They're, they're, they don't, there is actually a mirrored wall, and they, they don't exist. It kind of uh, uh, it reminds me right. of that. You're, right. you're in the, out um, there in the vapor. Uh, there's a mirrored wall and a, and a laugh track that is uh, uh, helping us out. Um, huh. Let's talk about, speaking of laugh tracks, let's talk about Euro Disney for a moment. Um, what has been... It's a cheap shot. What, what's been your experience working with Disney? Well, I alluded to my, uh, my um, delight in working with Michael Eisner. Right. There's a, to me, there's Disney, and then there's Michael Eisner. Right. And there's a... There's a You're there not the first to have observed that, yes. I, I'm sure. Right. Bob Stern will talk more about that, I'm sure. The, there's, a, there's a Disney momentum. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a force. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the momentum of Walt, or the inertia of Walt, however you want to see it. The projecting through, you know, through the years, through the decades, and then, uh, you know, a recent arrival with someone who has vision, who, who has some daring coming along to, um, to balance it in a very good way. And, you know, the interview was really, you know, 
when I first met him was interviewing me and I was interviewing you know kind of Disney it was very scary and and maybe there maybe I'm tainted because I'm, I'm working uh, on, on that 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 kind of project in terms of its uh, theminess and the kind of trap that implies um, I'm, I'm nervous about that mm -hmm. what do you think is it okay well, I haven't seen Euro <laughs> Disney yet so I don't know um, I mean it's a good answer but uh, having <laughs> Not yet seen it, I don't know. Um, One thing about yeah. working with him is that there's a, a person at the top to go to who, who makes the decisions, and you know you have to get there to, uh, to, to that, get that done, and he'll debate um, these points of, of um, my understanding of the West and my interpretation of the project. Um, but then you have to deal on a day-to-day -day basis with um, a lot of um, habits with well, other people. Well, my sense is that you know, Eisner is a remarkable and enlightened client, particularly as a corporate patron, but he has beneath him a bureaucracy that puts architects through as difficult a mill as any other corporate bureaucracy might. And uh, that despite the high level of patronage, um, architects are not always protected from that bureaucracy. Is that that's case. true. Yeah, yeah and, and I, but it, it's worth it. And I, mm -hmm. I've, I've done, I'm um, doing two projects. You're also doing an Orlando hotel, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where will that be? Will that be near the Michael Graves hotels? Or? No, it's in. <laughs> <laughs>